Hello, I am Dr. T.K. Swami, Surgical Gastroenterologist. This lecture video is about doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy safely in a simple cholecystectomy. What was started as a simple cholecystectomy sometimes will end up into a difficult cholecystectomy. I want to share a small story about a patient. Two weeks ago, I was called to see a patient in a, another hospital. The history of the patient is, the patient is a 55-year-old male. He underwent laparoscopic cholecystectomy one month ago. It was a simple cholecystectomy done by a trainee surgeon. The procedure lasted half an hour only. After two weeks, the same surgeon has done a laparotomy for perforative peritonitis. On the table, he found there was a perforation in the duodenum, second part of the duodenum above the papilla. It was 3 cm diameter perforation, probably a diathermy injury. So he trimmed the edges of the perforation and then sutured the perforation. He did duodenal raffi and then put in a tube in the right subcostal region. Subsequently, the patient developed a duodenal fistula. It was a high output duodenal fistula. He was bringing out 2500 to 3000 ml of pancreatic juice and bile. The patient was deteriorating day by day. I was called to see the patient only two weeks ago. When I went and saw the patient, the patient was in a moribund state. There were a lot of excoriations at the drain site. The main wound also was open. And the patient is not fit for any anesthesia. I suggested to put in a nasogeginal tube for feeding purpose and then put in a PTBD catheter to decrease the bile load at the fistula site. They were not able to do both. They did only a feeding jejunostomy. Two days ago, we lost the patient. The injuries can happen even to the experienced hands. Nobody is immune. But you need to be careful in every step of the operation, even if it is a simple cholecystectomy. In laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the bile duct injuries are common but the bowel injuries are more lethal. If you pick out the perforation within 24 hours, you can save 90% of the patients. If you pick out the perforation after 48 hours, you can save only 80% of the patient. If you pick out the perforation after one week, majority of them, they die. The mortality is very high. Mortality is around 19.2 to 20%. If you listen carefully and follow the steps which I am going to tell you in this lecture, your next cholecystectomy will be fundamentally different. Your patients will be safer. You will do a safe cholecystectomy. We divide the surgeons into three groups. Number one, I will use the iPad instead of the whiteboard. One is a consultant. Number two, is a trained surgeon. Number three is a trainee surgeon. What is the difference between these three people? The trainee surgeon is the one who has done less than 50 laparoscopic cholecystectomies under supervision. The trained surgeon is the one who has done more than 50 cases without supervision. The consultant is the one who can manage a difficult cholecystectomy. He knows how to do the bailout procedure. He knows how to manage the difficult scenario. Now this lecture is mainly for the trainee surgeon, the third one, who has done very few cases of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Without wasting much time, let us get into the subject matter. Coming to the subject matter, the gallbladder has got a number of rules of three. It has got three parts, namely the fundus, body and the infundibulum. We do the laparoscopic cholecystectomy mainly in three important steps, namely number one, adhesolysis, number two is the callus triangle dissection, number three is the gallbladder bed dissection. In each of these steps, there are three important structures hidden there. 
So totally, there are nine structures you need to remember. Along with the common bile duct, you need to remember only 10 important structures. It is not enough if you know what are these structures. You must know what are the structures, number one. Number two, why they get injured. Number three, how to avoid injuring them. So these three things you must know. First, let us take the adhesolysis. In adhesolysis, what are the structures that can get injured? Number one is the duodenum. Number two is the colon. Number three is the liver. Liver is not a problem because if you injure the liver, it will start bleeding. So it is in front of your eyes. But the problem with the duodenum and the colon is that the injury is not seen on the table. The patient presents late in the post-operative period only. So you have to be very, very careful as far as the duodenum and the colon is concerned. Next, you must know why they get injured. The duodenum and the colon, they get injured because of three reasons. One, the diathermy. Number two, retraction injury. Number three, faulty dissection technique. We will see one by one. See, the diathermy, you should not use near the bowel, anywhere. No energy sources near the bowel. If you want to do adhesolysis close to the bowel, you can use harmonic scalpel. But that also, we don't allow the juniors to use it. So don't use any energy source near the bowel. If you want to use, you can use the cold scissor. Coming to the retraction injury, the retraction injury is common because of, number one, because of faulty camera port position. Most of the surgeons, they put the camera in the umbilicus. In our patients, majority of the umbilicus is far lower down. If you put the camera in the umbilical port, half your vision will be obliterated by the bowel. So it is always better to go one to two inches above the umbilicus. The rough guide is, you make the midpoint between the ziphy sternum and the symphysis pubis. That midpoint will be the ideal place. That will be roughly one to two inches above the umbilicus. Number one, you have to put the camera port two inches above the umbilicus. Number two, while retracting, you should not retract the bowel with the sharper instruments like Maryland or a tooth grasp. The commonly injuring instrument is the suction cannula. If the tip of the suction cannula is sharper, it will get inside the bowel. So you have to be very, very careful with the instruments. As far as possible, don't hold the bowel with the instruments. Coming to the dissection, you must start the dissection from the top to bottom. Whereas in a callous triangle dissection, from below upwards you dissect. But in adhesolysis, you come from above downwards. It's exactly opposite. Similarly, in adhesolysis, you have to come from lateral to medial. In callous triangle dissection, you have to come from medial to lateral. While dissecting, you have to find the interface between the gallbladder and the omentum early in your dissection. First, you have to go and find out the interface, then start dissecting. Don't come closer to the bowel. You start the dissection above and move the omentum and the colon in most downwards. Don't come near the colon and the duodenum. If you start dissecting at the base of the omentum, what happens? You will be digging inside the fat and you will go behind the colon and the duodenum. You will injure the posterior wall of the duodenum or the colon. So it is very important. You should not start the dissection at the base of the omentum. You have to start the dissection at the top. That is the technique of doing the adhesolysis. Coming to the callous triangle, whether you do anterior dissection or posterior dissection, the three structures which you must remember apart from the common bile duct is number one is the right hepatic artery, number two is the cystic artery, number three is the right posterior sectoral duct. This is an anomaly, very common anomaly. You must be aware of it. First, uh, let us take the common bile duct. You have to safeguard the common bile duct first because common bile duct injury is very, very common. Number one is the Position of the patient. Position of the patient is the reverse Tendlenburg position, head up and right side up. The gallbladder fundus has to be retracted towards the right shoulder. The Hartman's pouch must be retracted right and down so that you open up the callus triangle. In the callus triangle, 
you have to be careful about the right hepatic artery. Whether it is an anterior dissection or posterior dissection, you are likely to injure the right hepatic artery. Any pulsatile vessel in the callus triangle will be a right hepatic artery. The cystic artery is rarely pulsatile. It is pulsatile only when you divide it. Otherwise, it will not be pulsatile. The cystic artery will be pulsatile when the Moynihan hump is there, the caterpillar hump is there. Caterpillar hump in the right hepatic artery will produce a pulsatile cystic artery. In those cases, the cystic artery will be shorter and it will be bigger. So whenever the cystic artery is bigger, you have to think of the Moynihan hump there, it might be hiding there. So it's very, very important. Why the right hepatic artery gets injured? Because most of the juniors, what they do, they insert the Maryland between the cystic artery and the cystic duct or the cystic artery and the gallbladder and open it at right angles. If the cystic artery is very small, it will get snapped. Where it will get snapped? It will get snapped from the right hepatic artery. So, to stop the bleeding, what you will do? You put a clip in the right hepatic artery. That's how the right hepatic artery gets injured. It's not a problem. You can ligate the right hepatic artery, no problem. The, because the liver has got a dual blood supply, the liver will not go in for necrosis. The liver has got a dual blood supply, but the bile duct has got only arterial supply. So later, these patients might go in for common bile duct stricture. So that you have to keep in mind. In the posterior dissection, why the right hepatic artery is injured is, one, when they injure the posterior cystic artery, to catch the bleeder, they go and catch the right hepatic artery. Or when you dissect more inside the liver, you are likely to injure the right hepatic artery in the posterior dissection. In the anterior dissection, what happens? The bleeding occurs because of the injury to the vessel which is supplying the cystic duct. A small vessel will be coming from the cystic artery to the cystic duct. Commonly that vessel gets injured, then there will be a pool of blood, then they will try to catch it or they will catch the cystic artery early before getting the critical view of safety. So even a small vessel has to be coagulated properly and then start dissecting. The technique of dissecting the cystic artery is you have to dissect the artery over the gallbladder and you must see that the vessel is disappearing inside the gallbladder. You should not course over the gallbladder or under the gallbladder. Whatever the structure that's going under the gallbladder must be left alone. You should not dissect this. That might be a posterior sacral duct. So the structure which goes below the gallbladder must be left behind. Only you have to dissect and see that the cystic artery is getting inside the gallbladder and disappearing there. So until then you have to dissect the cystic artery before clipping. This is very, very important as far as the cystic artery is concerned. Few words about right posterior sacral duct. The right lobe of the liver has got segment 5, 6, 7 and 8. The segments 5 and 8 are drained by the anterior sacral duct. The segment 6 and 7 is drained by the posterior sacral duct. The anterior sacral duct is not a problem because that will not come into our view. Just forget about it. Only the segments 6 and 7 are drained by the posterior sacral duct. This duct is a problem. This can join anywhere from the cystic duct to the top of the common hepatic duct. Anywhere he can go and join. So when you dissect the callus triangle, you have to be very careful. Any tubular structure, you don't dissect across the tubular structure. Because these ducts are very small, less than 2 millimeters. So you are likely to get injured. In the callus triangle, commonly this duct is mistaken for the cystic artery. Because cystic artery is not pulsatile. This is also not pulsatile. Then how to differentiate? The right posterior sacral duct will go under the gallbladder. This will not go over the gallbladder. So it will go under the gallbladder. If you dissect the cystic artery, you can dissect the artery over the gallbladder. It will go and disappear in the gallbladder. It will not go anywhere. But the right posterior sacral duct will go under the gallbladder. Whatever the tubular structure that goes under the gallbladder must be left there. Don't disturb them. This is what it is. This is how you have to dissect it. Coming to the gallbladder bed dissection, our juniors, once they divide the cystic artery and the cystic duct, they just relax. No, you should not relax. 
you must be vigilant right from the beginning to the end of the operation. This is very, very important. In gallbladder bed, you get three important structures. One is the duct of Lusca. Number two is the subfacial duct. Number three is the middle hepatic veins. The duct of Lusca is not a big deal. What is the difference between duct of Lusca and the subfacial duct? The duct of Lusca will enter the gallbladder. But the subvesical duct will not enter the gallbladder, but it will course over the, under the gallbladder, along the gallbladder. It will go down. So it will not enter the gallbladder. The duct which enters the gallbladder is the duct of Lusca. These ducts are very small, but injuring them will definitely produce symptoms in the immediate postoperative period. So the patient will need intervention. So it is very important. Gallbladder bed dissection is very, very important. How to safeguard them? Most of the time, duct of Lusca is seen only after injuring them. Before injuring them, you cannot find out. So only after injuring them, you will know. If you see bile there in the gallbladder bed, you take suture, take 5-0 or 4-0 proline, then you can take a suture and then tighten it. Or you can put a clip also. So at the end, you must wash and see there is no bile leak. Coming to the middle hepatic veins, they are seen in the middle of the gallbladder bed. They are bigger veins. Their size ranges from 1 mm to 5 mm. Imagine the size of the 5 mm instrument. So, so big they will be. So, you have to be very, very careful when you dissect the middle of the gallbladder. You have to direct the hook towards the gallbladder, not towards the liver. And you must maintain the cystic plate over the liver. The fibrous tissue you have to maintain over the liver. You should not breach that cystic plate. If you injure the middle hepatic veins, they bleed profusely. You have to only suture. You cannot apply the clip. While suturing also, if you tighten too much, they will bleed profusely. Then how to control it? There is a technique called control tightening with concomitant suction irrigation. I will tell you what it is. You ask the assistant to put suction irrigation at the site of the bleeder. You take a suture and then put a knot and tighten it gradually. Don't tighten it too much. Gradually tighten it until the bleeding stops. Once the bleeding stops, stop there. Don't tighten too much, then complete the knot. Another technique is putting a slip knot and then slipping it until the bleeding stops and then stop there and divide the and cut the suture. These are the two techniques of suturing the middle hepatic veins when there is bleeding. The take home message is, the laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a potentially dangerous operation. You have to be vigilant right from the beginning to the end of the operation. You can do laparoscopic cholecystectomy safely only when you know the anatomy very clearly. You learn the dissection technique properly under supervision. Then only you can do laparoscopic cholecystectomy safely. Our aim is perfection to the core. No compromise, no complications. Thank you very much for watching this video. Your comments are welcome. A simple laparoscopic cholecystectomy video will follow this lecture. You can watch that as well. Thank you very much.